Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews. I'm your host, Lucy, and some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X. Today, we have a guest in my show who I always like to talk with, and that is Louis James, a.k.a. Lobo Tigre, a.k.a. Due Diligence Guy. Uh, Lobo, thanks for coming to my show once again. It is great to have you. Happy to be back with you. Thanks. Lobo, I would like to cover today, I would like to cover 10 commodities, and those are uranium, gold, silver, copper, lithium, nickel, oil, rare earths, uh, natural gas, and coal. Uh, I believe that we will manage to cover them all, uh, So, but I would like to start with my favor, and that is uranium. Uh, where are we now in the bull cycle for uranium? And what would you message to potential new investors entering the uranium space, uh, uranium space on what should they keep an eye on? Well, boy, we could do the whole show on just that one topic. Uh, yes. But I'll, I'll try to rip through the key points. And it's a good time that you ask because we have just published an updated version of our free uranium port that, the report that we've done. We've updated it for the latest input or lack thereof from Kazakhstan, some other thoughts. So the near-term balance of supply and demand have shifted significantly. So we thought it'd be worth updating people precisely because of you know the question that you're asking. And the answer, in my view, well, in, it, not, to, not to steal too much thunder from the, from the report, but we're very bullish still. The, the recent changes have all been even more bullish. The real question is, you know, plus or minus $90, um, are high prices going to cure high prices? So we've had a correction. Is it a correction before prices head north again? Or yeah. was that it? It was 106 the top, and now high prices are curing high prices. And this isn't just a theoretical issue of, oh, nothing goes vertical forever. We have, um, you know, the biggest producers in the world bringing production back online. We have the lowest cost projects in the world being built not just someday or not just starting, but actually coming online now. As you and I speak, there are uh, at least two high profile uranium plates that are coming on, like drumming yellow cake now and, and getting going in that direction. Yeah. So I think it's a it's a very reasonable question to ask. And you know, the long answer is the report. The short answer is I think it's a correction. I think this is an opportunity. If you miss the big rally in 2023, then you want to be looking at what's still on sale now. Uh, you know, I could say a lot more about any one of those points, but that's the that's the short version. Okay, uh, but are you targeting developers, producers, explorers, ETFs? Can you give me some color on that? Well, it depends on the person, really. If you're very risk averse. You know, why bother messing with any of them? Just buy one of the ETFs that represents the commodity itself. Uranium can't go bankrupt. Its price may go up or down, but, you know, it, it is what it is, right? So it's it's not, it can't go to zero. <laughs> Though I suppose another Chernobyl would probably take us pretty close. We'd test that hypothesis. Yeah. But, but yeah, if I'm, you know... A, older on a fixed income, if I really can't afford to risk too much, but I want to I want to bet on uranium, then that's the way I would go. For a little bit more leverage, I'd go with the producers. Um, if I have time, actually, I, I think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go down the producer food chain. I'd skip straight to the developers because of my work on the pre-production sweet spot. I know that you're familiar with that and your audience probably knows about it. We've been talking about it a lot. But if anybody's missed it, that's another free download. There's, if you go to the free report section of my website, the pre-production sweet spot report will explain that. And short version of that is it's a unusually reliable, as in high probability of success, strategy for speculating on natural resources, not just uranium. So I like that. There's, it's, it's not quite the 10-bagger potential of betting on a discovery, right? Yeah. But your odds of success are much higher than betting on a discovery. And then, you know, on down the food chain, if I'm 19 and I've got no kids, no risk, you know, I can I can blow all the money I have and pick myself up and do it again. If I lose it all, you know, the, then maybe I, I swing for the bleachers on some of the, you know, the bottom of the food chain companies in this space. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Uh, but Lobo, uh, we saw some developers, uh, producers at 
no, not we saw. We are uh, seeing uh, developers at all time highs, like UEC, NextGen, and those kind of names. But we see we are seeing some explorers at fifty two week low. So would you agree that the next move could be more explosive for explorers? Are they mispriced, so to say? No, I, I would not agree. I think most explorers are worth zero. <laughs> and you know, and the market, if if the market is failing to distinct, and by the way, that's not just me being rhetorical. I, I literally believe that those projects okay. never get built. There are some, there are some of those you can doll it up, you know, pig with lipstick, make it look good on paper, but I don't think those will ever be mined. Okay. Uh, now, if you can find one that really does have the right stuff, this could be a mine, and it's on sale with all the rest. Yes, that becomes much more interesting. But but if we're talking a project that could become a mine, we're really not talking exploration. We're already talking at least the early stages of development. They've already made the discovery. So when I talk about swing for the bleachers with exploration, I'm talking pre-discovery. And at that point, you know, you can't tell. So, you know, yes, if the, you know, if we've got a bull market and somebody makes a big discovery, that stock will definitely have much more explosive upside. The problem is nobody can predict that. Uh, not Rick Rule, not Doug Casey, certainly not me. You know, th that's why these people, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires out there that have the resources, they kind of shotgun the whole market. And that's how they can manage to grab so many of these discoveries because they can afford to take risks on a very large number of stocks that most average retail people can't. You know, if you pick a basket of a half a dozen exploration plays, that might seem like a reasonable risk mitigation, half a dozen, maybe a, maybe a dozen, mm -hmm. you know, but there's, but there's scores of them out there. And, you know, maybe one of them makes a, makes a discovery this year. So the odds are against you in that space. Uh, yeah. So uh, again, the, the, the ultimate answer to your question is it depends on your risk reward profile, what you're looking for, Always that sort of thing. My, my personal answer is I, and it's not just uranium. It, discovery is so hard to predict that I just never bet on pre-discovery exploration as, as an evil scum of the earth newsletter writer it's just too hard. You 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 make too it many mistakes. Hard. Too many people get wiped out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Agreed. It is very very hard. Uh, Lobo, let's move to silver. Uh, we are finally seeing silver over thirty dollar levels and holding. Uh, is the party just started for silver? Well, um, people are going to love me and hate me for saying this. I'm I'm of two minds on silver. You know, Darth Silver Darth comes Silver. back to haunt me, right? Yeah. yeah. But this isn't a Darth Silver thesis, actually. This isn't Silver's acting more like copper, because actually it isn't. In recent months, it's, it's gone back to acting like gold as a monetary metal should, which is why I actually amended my outlook for 2024. Going into 2024, I was not looking to buy silver stocks. I was looking to buy gold and then watch silver to see what it did in the recession that I still think you know, is in the cards for the US and see if silver would track copper more than gold because it had been doing that. Currently, or as of last week, the correlation between silver and copper prices is higher than between silver and gold. Now, all three of them have done a hockey stick lately, so they're all correlated. But, you know, if if you've been watching silver and saying it looks a lot more like copper, you're not imagining things. That That's actually in the math. That, you know, that was happening. Mm -hmm. But in my view, that has changed. And so, yes, I put silver on my shopping list this year. If anything, a great silver play is so hard to find that I'm putting more effort and energy into trying to find silver picks that I don't already own, that I like. Uh, and th so the issue here is, um, you know, country risk has really become a problem. Um, I, I don't actually think it's accidental for historical reasons. You know, where do the conquistadors go? Uh, there, I think there's a historical relationship and a reason why so much of the world's best silver districts are in kleptocratic countries that, you know, really make me nervous about investing there. So, you know, there are great silver projects out there, but I'm very uh, politically risk averse. And that leaves me with very few choices. I was saying I was of two minds. So, you know, the good news for silver bulls and everybody, oh, He's not Darth Silver anymore. He put silver, you know, he's hooray silver. 
Uh, the bad news is that silver moving to 30 now, A, it doesn't fit the pattern that typically silver has. And B, it seems out of whack with where the market is. There's, there's no particularly compelling reason why that you can see, I think, either as a TA or as a fundamental analyst, why silver should have done that. So that makes me nervous about how long silver could, you know, it, it would be, people will hate it, but it would be perfectly reasonable for silver to correct back below 30, you know, if it, if it corrects to 28, 29 bucks or something like that, that'd still be a great price for companies that were already making money at lower prices or the better projects out there. Uh, but people would hate it, right? Oh, if, if it's not going up, then it's no good, right? Yeah, so yeah. silver makes me a little bit nervous and nervous in the immediate term because of this vertical move that we've seen. But sorry, on the third paw, and I know you've got 10 commodities you want to get to, but this is important. It oh, sure. is true. It's we're not just in, in, imagining this. It is true that, you know, whereas gold has hit at least nominally all-time high after all-time high. Silver is still well below its previous all-time high. And that's not even adjusting for inflation. That's yeah. just a nominal all-time high. So, you know, markets are not always rational. I do not believe in the efficient market hypothesis. It's precisely because markets are so often irrational, they get overbought or oversold. Exactly. And it's pretty exciting to see something like this silver breakout. You know, it's an energy metal. It's part of the green agenda. It's a monetary metal. It, you know, it's an inflation hedge. It's all this stuff going for it. It's industrial and monetary aspects could actually propel silver much higher than supply and demand would suggest. And that can happen right away, or it might happen later this year. I don't know. Um, but I'm glad I still have some silver in my portfolio, and I'm actively looking for more. That's a great breakdown of silver. I have a hypothetical question for you. Let's say uh, I own physical uh, portfolio of silver, of, of, of physical silver, and I bought it. My average price is, let's say, around $14. Would you unload some? No. If, if you were me? No. No, you would keep it. So. And I wouldn't care what the average price was because my reason for owning physical silver or gold bullion is not as an investment. I don't invest in gold or silver. Okay. I don't speculate in either about the movements. I own them because they are money. They yeah. are physical wealth that I can hold in my hand. It's a long for which there is no short. There's no counterparty risk. I didn't buy any of the silver that I have to sell when it goes up. If, if I never sell an ounce of it and my kids inherit it, that would be fine with me. Uh, that would mean that I never had to use that insurance. You know, on the other hand, savings are not just as insurance. They're also for opportunity. And I have dipped into bullion before, like to buy a house, you know, that sort of thing. So th that would be the sort of thing that would prompt me to consider dipping into my silver or gold, not price movements. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Lobo, gold is at all-time high. Uh, what is that telling? Really. No, yeah. Uh, what is that telling us about the economic, political, and safety situation in the world? Are you afraid to see gold at 3,000, 4,000? <laughs> no, no, three, you you addressed for inflation and 3,000 isn't even a real high. So no, three doesn't scare me. But I do agree with the sentiment you've heard from probably Rick and others. You know, I I think Rick likes to say that the reason why I'm, I own gold is because I'm afraid it's going to $10,000. A world in which we have $10,000 gold is a world in which there is some serious shit going down. That's a technical exactly. description of the situation there. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure I'd want to see that world, you know, having my yeah. gold go up that much is, I'll be worried about what's going on. Like, like Doug Casey says, my other mentor, you know, I, I'd want to see that on my TV, not outside my front window. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get the question, but no, 3000 wouldn't do it. Um, you know, you mentioned things that we, I'm sure the audience is aware. We don't need to beat that to death. We've got two hot wars, either one of which could become World War III. You know, if there's bad stuff out there, yeah. that is a good reason for people to be hedging, you know, their bets here. But you asked about it, gold is a signal. And so there's two ways I look at that. One is, I think gold is calling BS on the Fed and the central banks of the world. And yes, 
you know, the global South is buying gold and so on, but still it's, all right, let me rephrase it. It's calling BS on the Fed and the fiat currencies of the world. Mm. I think that's indisputable. And the other thing, and this is more speculative, is that gold tends to lead inflation. Like people look at, if you correlate gold and CPI, it's actually a terrible correlation. It's almost non-existent. And the reason for that is, is because gold leads. So like, in, and we just saw this in 2020, gold goes way up, like massive run. Inflation does nothing, like it's bupkis. It's still basically zero. And then 2021 comes along, 2022, we get this huge surge in inflation, but gold's already up over 2000 bucks. So it stays yeah. there, right? So, so gold moves, inflation does nothing. Inflation moves, gold does nothing. So there's no correlation. But obviously, you know, the gold did matter and it told us what was coming. You know, anybody with half a brain could see that all the crazy stuff governments were doing in response to the COVID lockdowns was inflationary. And, you know, markets are forward looking and that's what gold signaled. So if that's what's happening now, notice the word if, right? If that's what's happening now, gold is signaling higher, significantly higher inflation ahead. And that actually fits with my macro view. But we'll have to see. I tend to agree with you on that, definitely. Uh, let's move to copper. World needs copper. No new mines. Grades are declining. Supply and demand picture is pretty clear here. Uh, would you call a copper a no-brainer for investment in the long run? In the long run, absolutely. Yes. I, I, I would say I'm even more, like, if you ask me 10 years, 20 years, I'm more bullish on copper than anything else, even uranium even though I see nuclear energy proliferating around the world. I'm extremely bullish on both. Of course, I'm bullish on gold. But if it goes up that much, they'll cut some zeros off the dollar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the visible exchange rate could actually go down, right? Um, but copper is, you know, the Dr. Copper thing can be taken too far. But there's something to that, right? It is an essential industrial mineral. Uh, just simply global population growth alone means higher copper prices going forwards. And because of all the not in my backyard thinking, this NIMBY thinking, as you mentioned, you know, the supply isn't there. It's not coming online. There's some disagreement about how much surplus or deficit there might be in the nearest term, but there's very little disagreement in the industry. Basically, everybody sees that there's just not enough copper mines. Um, the supply isn't there. And by the way, you'll hear that I'm not saying anything about electric cars. That's sauce for the goose. Like higher copper I see is baked in the cake, even if not another Tesla is ever sold again starting today, right? Which mm -hmm. is obviously not going to happen. The the extra demand from the electric cars adds to it's it. Good. I saw, uh, you know, this isn't my team's math, but I, I think it was BMO or one of these large firms put out a chart showing that we need basically to double uh, copper production by... I, I, by 2050 or 24, it wasn't 2030. It was, it was farther ahead, like 2040 or 2050. We need to double copper production uh, to keep up with demand with no EVs. Like they had it, that as a base case. And then with EVs, like the chart just goes yeah. nuts. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm extremely bullish on copper. My only caveat here is my, and this covers everything else you're going to ask about, is that I still think the US is headed for an undeniable recession. I think it's in a rolling recession now. I think the last bastion of strength that the US likes to cling to saying that it has such a wonderful economy is this strong laborer slash consumer. And the latest data in both of those, retail sales and, and uh, labor market statistics, they're all weaker. Yeah. So, you know, if it's not a done deal yet, but if that last pillar of strength is starting to crack, it tells you something. Plus those infamously long and variable lags, we are now, like just now, getting to the average duration of a long and variable lag. Like it, it's literally next month when that would be the average on the bell curve of when those lags start turning into a recession, historically, specifically to the United States. So the recession isn't even late yet. You know, all these people running around saying no recession, no recession. If it hasn't shown up, it's not going to. They're simply wrong or historically ignorant. Uh, we are at that cusp now. So I love copper. It, it's, you know, as you say, it is a no brainer going forward, but ahead of a recession, experience tells us industrial minerals get whacked. 
Now, I have to say, and I'm sorry to talk so much about one commodity here. No, no, please. Your list, please. But this is important. I got to say, I've been uh, objectively looking at copper's price action this year. I've been dead wrong about this. Right? Uh, like I missed out, and anybody who listened to me missed out on the chance to profit from copper hitting a, a nominal all-time high this year. That's true. It's simply a fact. Um, but given the same inputs, I would make the same call again. Industrial metals always, always, always get whacked in a recession. And until I'm sure the recession is either done its worst or I'm wrong about it, like there's no recession, you know, I just can't pile into copper. So yes, I missed it. Yes, I still think the recession and, and the correction is coming. And we'll just have to see how that plays out. But longer term, like, sorry, the takeaway would be if I'm a copper bull, I'm just uber copper bull, I get all this and I have a long investment time horizon. And I had, I knew from experience that I could buy a copper stock, see it drop 50% in the months ahead yeah. and then become a 10 bagger in the years ahead. If I knew that I could stomach that 50% drop, well, then maybe I'd start buying copper stocks because maybe I'm wrong about the recession, right? Yeah. Uh, but my experience is that very few people can actually do that. Most people would freak out, especially if it's a producer that's supposed to be profitable and suddenly is not profitable. It's got debt covenants, all these issues. People would freak out. They'd sell. They would end up with buying high and selling <laughs> low, and that's not the formula. Yeah, what uh, do you have similar views on lithium? What's your take on lithium going forward? Similar, but lithium has uh, already been whacked, right? So instead of coming at it from a from an all time high, we're looking yeah. at a substantial correction already. However, um, it is it, it well a it's an industrial mineral, and if I'm you know it falls in that bucket of I'm not buying any industrial minerals until I'm sure the recession is done its worst or until history proves that I'm wrong, it's different this time, and there's not going to be a recession. Either one of those, then lithium becomes more interesting. But the other thing is that lithium, unlike Dr. Copper, or even nickel, both of which are industrial metals that have large-scale multiple uses, you know, nickel's made used in steel and all kinds of things. Um, lithium has multiple uses, but the big one is the cars, is the EVs. And even if we come... Even if we don't go into a hard landing scenario, but people don't just start rushing out and buying cars right away. It's the sort of thing that takes time for confidence to recover. That's a major ticket item. After your house, a new car is one of the biggest things people will spend money on. And it's a decision they don't come to quickly or lightly. So it takes time. So even if there's no recession, I'm wrong. I think that takes time to recover. And if I'm right, and there is a recession, you know, it, it goes even lower and then it takes more time. At the same time, you have producers ramping up. So this is where one, it could be quite diabolical. And I'm, I don't have the math on this, but I know that our friend Rick Rule thinks that there's new production, significant new production coming online now that yeah. could make lithium even more hated, not just this year, but for several years to come. So that makes me pretty cautious about rushing into lithium. Like as soon as I'm sure the recession is either a no-show or behind us, I'm jumping in copper and I know you're gonna ask about it, so oil as well. Lithium, I wouldn't automatically jump in. I'd wanna see how's the market responding? You know, Are the EVs starting to come back? So we'll see. That having been said, sorry, the, the capping point on this is it's gonna take years before we get hydrogen cars or other technology to replace the, the lithium batteries. Even the LFPs are bad news for cobalt and not so great for nickel, but they're still lithium batteries. So I do think that once, once the recessionary action is behind us, I do see a rebound in lithium, even with the new production. But it's something that you know I want to see happening. Or, you know, I want to see that trend in motion before I bet on it. Yeah, Rick has an angle. You said it right. Uh, I, I'm somewhere between you and Rick in, on this. So uh, you're, you you made a great point uh, here. So I'm between you and Rick. But let's move to another one. And uh, on this one, I'm especially curious to hear your opinion. A rare earth. How do you see the future here? Will the all meta metals benefit uh, from... Or, I mean, will all the metals, for rare earth metals benefit 
or there are some specific ones from that group that will benefit more than the others? Well, yes. I mean, there are, you know, the, the, the ones most needed for the superpowered magnets, I think, have the most solid case here. But actually, let me back up and say, I don't think that's the most important thing. The most important thing that with a single source of supply being subject to political, not just economic incentives, the big problem with the rare earth market is not looking at supply and demand and who's got you know exploration success and all that stuff. The big problem is that you have this huge variable, 90% and falling, but still close to 90% of the supply comes from China. And China can unilaterally, for political reasons, simply cut off supply, exactly. or maybe not, but you know, greatly increase the cost of all these things. You know, and if you're long already, that's great. But if they, if you're betting on that, and then they don't do that, and you know, rare earths, contrary to their name, are not rare, and some of these other projects start coming online, you have a high prices cure high prices, or you could then actually see, and we have actually seen this in the past. When Mountain Pass first started moving forward, you know, Chinese cut prices and bankrupted the project. So <laughs> I could see a case where people start bringing rare earth projects online in Canada, the US or other places. And, and the Chinese suddenly decide that, oh, uh, you know, the, the Beijing decides that it's a good idea to, to increase the supply and lower the cost of rare earths. Or the opposite could happen. We could be in a situation right now where Biden, in his infinite wisdom, slapped a 100% tariff yeah. on Chinese electric cars. I don't think we've seen the end of the Chinese response. There's a chance the Chinese could say, you know, you know, those rare earths you like so much, guess what? They're going to cost you 100% more. Uh, so there's actually an investment thesis here. If you listen carefully to what I'm saying, there's an opportunity, especially if China chokes off the rare earths, to just see like tremendous gains. You know, the, the, the costs of the underlying minerals can double. The share prices in the companies that have those minerals can 5x or 10x in a situation like that. The market can be very irrational. But that's an if not when question. Like there's literally, there's no trend. We can't say China is 73.5% to the way of banning these things. They either, you know, ban or they don't. They either slap new tariffs on or they don't. And we'll know when we know. So... I see that not as disciplined speculation. I see it as gambling. Now, if you've got play money, you want to gamble in this space, you know, maybe that's a fun gamble. I, I think I, that would be more fun to me than going to Las Vegas and putting money in a slot machine. Uh, but I would think of it as being like that. Yeah, it's a gamble. I agree. But uh, if you have spare money, like you said, it, it's a good gamble, in my opinion. Uh, I will gamble a little bit on rare earths. Uh, let's move uh, on. Uh, oil. What's your take on oil? Oil is like copper in my view, um, with the exception that it has potentially more explosive upside after the recession, because the, the you know, copper is not capital starved. The constraint on copper is the NIMBY thinking and the permitting and the you know the regular it's it's regulatory burden. It's not hated the way oil is. Yeah. You know, there's no stop copper now uh, NGO out there blocking roads and throwing tomato soup at priceless works of art. So I, I, that makes me like copper better. I know you've heard our friend Rick Rule saying, I love hate, you know, and a commodity that's necessary is hated. There's opportunity there. And there's still a lot of hate for oil. And ironically, I think these stop oil now people and their sympathizers are going to push oil prices higher. You know, if it's not politically correct to provide capital to this sector, but we still need it, right? You know, <laughs> there's, I, th I think there's actually tremendous upside here. My, my only hang up right now, and I have a little bit in the portfolio, and the only reason I don't have more is because I'm still on team hard landing. And, I'm, and I want to be sure the recession is in the rearview mirror. I mean, remember, I don't expect anything this extreme, but in 2020, we saw WTI go negative, right? In a... In a crazy world with government intervention left and right. I'm not saying we'll see oil go negative again, but we could see massive drawdowns in this space that would have multiplied effects on the stocks. And I just I just can't get in front of that steamroller. And I don't want my readers, my clients to risk money ahead of something like that. 
as yeah. soon as the risk is behind us, that's another no brainer in my view. I like it a lot. Yeah, we have another commodity that is needed but hated, and that is coal. What's your take on coal? You might think it would be the same as oil, but I'm more cautious about coal because it's not globally fungible in the way oil is. You don't ship coal from Australia to Germany. I mean, you might in an emergency, but generally speaking, you don't. You know, you, you hop it across the, the sea right there to, to China. Or it's a it's a big, low, relatively low value bulk commodity. You want to ship it as little as possible. And so it tends to have regional markets. You need to understand those regional market dynamics. And yes, it's still necessary, but it's not just something that, you know, we want to phase out by 2050 or something. This is public enemy number one. There are countries that even if they need it, they're phasing it out now. It is, yeah. you know, if 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 you have to use a bit more natural gas or even your, you know, nuclear power, even if you don't like it, you'll you'll do that to meet your green goals. Whereas coal, if there's any possible way, no matter how much it costs, if there's any possible way to not burn coal, that's the first thing to go. So I think it's it's just it's riskier. It's not just a it's not just a stock picker sector. It's it's um, it's one to be very careful. And if so, if I did go, I'd look for the right region. I'd look for the right company, and I'd look for some story that has a very short fuse. Like I, I'm not interested in any coal plays with a five or ten year thing. No exploration, like none. No coal exploration, mm -hmm. or even development. Probably not, unless they're right about to to you know start delivering to the market. I would look for a. A uh, profitable flow. producer with growth potential, like now, something that has added value in the next 12 to 24 months, no longer than that. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, we have two more uh, natural gas. Natural gas, gas is just too wonky for me. It, I mean, it's <laughs> it <laughs> periodically goes to zero in the United States if a pipeline breaks down or something. And you could say, oh, well, you know, that's idiosyncratic to yeah but if your company that you bought because it's so great is on the wrong side of that broken pipeline and, <laughs> and suddenly it's paying people to take its natural gas you know that sucks to be you in that case right yeah so it's it's just a tricky market and there's there's a lot of natural gas out there so yeah you know generally i like oil and gas after the recession but oil is just much easier. It's it's much easier to pick stocks that are likely to win and not have a sudden adverse reaction. You know, that said, for somebody who really does a deep dive, takes time to educate themselves and pick the right players. Yeah, I think there's a lot of money to be made there, but it, it's not easy. This is not for beginners. Definitely. Uh, final one, and you already touched a bit on uh, nickel. Yeah, so well, one, there's a market disruption right now, right, in New Caledonia. So uh I I think it's a, it would be a mistake to look at signals like that, this recent upturn we've seen in nickel as an indication of the market going into a deficit or something like that. Um I, I think well, by the way, we also have a free nickel report on a website that still needs to be updated. But okay. I bring it up because what's happened now and why nickel is already hated is that you have all this laterite nickel from Indonesia, Philippines, and you know, and Asia coming online and you know, basically oversupplying the market. This is significant because the, the sulfide nickel producers where you could see it in the PowerPoints of all these exploration and development companies of, oh, you got to have class one LME nickel. You have to have the right nickel for the batteries. Uh, we call bullshit on that. And it turned out that, you know, it was bullshit. Ultimately, nickel is a metal, right? <laughs> and if you've got the nickel, you can make the batteries one way or the other. So we, we pointed out and we were right that there's a lot of non LME, you know, class one nickel out there and it was kind of ridiculous to to claim that the, the prices had to go up. So that's still out there. And yes, uh, there's a, a fair amount of environmental cost to this type of production. And even Rick has said that he thinks that the the impact of that is enough that even places like you know Indonesia and the Philippines will scale back uh, that kind of production. 
And I suspect that he's probably right, but I suspect that that takes quite a bit of time. And especially if, you know, if the global economy is already weak and the U.S. goes over the edge and, and pulls the whole thing even lower, that's not a time where you start saying, you know, if maybe Western countries get more environmental religion in that case, but Asian countries, they're like, screw that. We got to make money here. We got to, we need tax revenue. We need to, you know, support the economy. So I, I guess I, I, what I'm saying here is that I, I don't see the supply constraint coming anytime soon. Uh, that said, it it is an important industrial metal. I don't hang my thesis on the EVs at all. I think coming out of the recession, I'll look at the balance of the market at that time. And I could actually imagine myself buying nickel stocks at that time if, if the downturn has constrained supply. Like if I, I don't see environmental concerns five years from now, cutting back supply in Indonesia and the Philippines or China, but an economic downturn would. And if they start mothballing mines, the market could easily co overcorrect and uh, then low prices would be the cure for low prices and there'd be an opportunity there. Excellent point. Uh, Lobo, we finished those 10 commodities. Now I have just final part and this is q and I have six questions from my followers. One minute answer maximum for those, okay? I'll try. Uh, first question, uh, who are Lobo's favorite CEOs? Oh, one you minute or less. Name, name few. Okay. Um, I'm not sure they're CEOs. I really like Ron Peratt, formerly AUEX, right? Renaissance. Um, I like Jorge Ganosa from first, not first, um, from Fortuna Silver. Uh, you know, there's issues with that company, but he's always struck me as a real straight shooter, a quality operator. Like him a lot. Uh, don't know any of the key people as CEO personally at Agnico, but in my entire experience in 20 years, you know, you'd run into Agnico people in the field as the JV partner of some junior that I was interested in or something like that. And the the quality of their work, the excellence of operations has always been there for Agnico. And you know, prices go up or down, and some people don't like majors or whatever. I'm not touting the stock. But I'm, there's a culture there of excellence in operations that I think has to say something about the guy at the top, even if I've never met him. I think my minute's up, but that's what comes to the top of my mind. Okay. Uh, next one. Uh, what was your biggest investment success story and what was your biggest disappointment? Uh, well, my biggest gainer would probably be actually First Majestic Silver, Though I didn't personally own that at the time, I was back in my Casey days. But I remember, um, I remember, and this was my call. I remember putting a buy on it. They had three big properties at first. One of them, they drilled it, and it was a total dud, and the stock fell off a cliff, like it dropped sixty percent. And I thought, well, gee, if one third of their assets went away and the stock is down two thirds, that's an opportunity. And it went from like a buck to over $20. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. So, But it was something on the order of a 20 or 25 bagger on, on my call. So that would be one of my biggest wins. I don't own that stock. I'm not recommending it. Um, you know, um, but that would be personally one of my, my, my biggest ones. And sorry, what was the other part of the question? Uh, what is the biggest, what is your biggest disappointment? Oh, that one's easy. There's a there's another free uh, document on the website called My Two Biggest Mistakes and What You Can Learn From Them. One was Rubicon, and the other one was Banks Island Gold. And uh, the, the commonality, very different companies, but the commonality was building a mine without a proper feasibility study. And the one, probably the Ru Rubicon was the most painful one, because Banks Island almost made it. But Rubicon... Oh, the, the worst thing is that the marketing guys back then asked me for one pick and I hate saying giving one pick. I always like a basket or put, but they said, no, if you could only buy one today, which would it be? And I picked Rubicon and boy, did that blow up on me. So yeah, I remember that one. Uh, okay. Uh, Mark wants to know how would the peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine affect commodities, especially precious metals? Precious metals, I would say almost not at all. If you said oil and gas, yeah, that would make a difference. 
you know, we'd have to see, you know, would could they really kiss and make up? Could Europe say, okay, we're going to buy mm -hmm. Russian gas again? Yeah, I could see them buying some, but I don't think they ever go back to the way it was. They they realized the vulnerability, and I don't think they ever want to be that vulnerable again. So I think a, a moderate impact on on hydrocarbons, no impact on on monetary metals. And I don't think this is going to happen anyway. I mean, they're the only way, like Putin never kisses and makes up with the West. The only way that ends, you know, is either Russia wins or Ukraine, um, no, or, or or somebody kills Putin, like assassinates him or something like that. Maybe that wins. Uh, I, I just don't see a happy ending here. Sorry. No problem. Uh, next one, uh, name five jurisdiction where you would never invest your money. South Africa, Bolivia, would he <laughs> never? I don't know. Uh, yeah, never. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, things can change. Right I now, mean, at Mexico the moment, is going the wrong the way. Per Peru scares me. There are a lot of countries in Central America. There's just not mining countries. You know, Costa Rica, you know, it's very unlikely, you know, um, the the uh, Sahel countries right now that are in trouble, I wouldn't say never, but I, I would not put money into Mali or Burkina Faso, places like that. I, I think that's five. Yeah, that's five. Uh, okay, Bill wants to know, how do you see U.S. monetary system in 10 years? <laughs> uh, Non-existent? No, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, well, like my friend Brent Johnson, the dollar milkshake guy says, you know, it's going to take time to dethrone the dollar. Um, <clears throat> but it is contrary to the uh, de-dollarization deniers out there of the world. The dollar's share of global reserve currency is dropping every year. Like that, that is a visible multi-decade trend. I think that continues. Um, I was just talking with Lynn Alden about this, and an interesting thing is though that with with fiat currencies failing in so many countries, like you know the Argentinian peso, where Millet wants to go with the dollar instead, or other countries that if not officially, but de facto, their, their fiat currencies are so dysfunctional that they're essentially dollarized. Um, you could actually see the dollar gain market share as a reserve currency as other fiat currencies implode. And if they implode, you know, they, they might, some people might buy more gold or buy some more Bitcoin, but the government, you know, are they gonna adopt the Yuan or the Euro? Probably not, you know, they'll, they'll dollarize. So you could look at this on the Forex, you could look at this on reserves and things like that. And there are question marks about where this goes. But ultimately, the one thing there's no question about is that the purchasing power of the dollar continues to decline dramatically. We, are, we have yet to pay the piper for everything that's been done since the COVID-19 lockdowns. And I think that we're going to see, if I'm right about the recession ahead, I think we're going to see the money helicopters fly. And even if nothing big happens, it's just what governments do. They debase their fiat currencies every year. They they try to convince the public that inflation is a good thing, and they have inflation targets, which means, you know, hidden tax targets. So that's the one thing there's no question of. Like real things priced in any fiat unit, including including the dollar, ten years from now, will will be seeing higher prices. Okay, final question. Uh, is there a bearish scenario for uranium besides nuclear accident? Yes. If I'm wrong about the balance of supply and demand and high prices are in the process of curing high prices, <laughs> let's let's say, I mean, my, the, the thing is that the low-hanging fruit, the projects that can be brought on quickly, that's happening now. So... After that, I mean, people talk about, you know, these, the, the high-grade well-known projects in the Athabasca Basin and so on. Those are, those are going to take years. There, there are is. models out there. Like if you look at supply models for a lot of big firms, you'll see this big spike in 2030. And that's basically when the Western Athabasca comes online. That's an assumption. Those projects aren't even permitted yet, let alone shovels getting close to hitting dirt. So... <laughs> You know, 
you know, I think this is a very unlikely scenario, but but this would be how, besides another Chernobyl, how could I be wrong? These projects coming online now meet the market demand. The companies that bought pounds when they were cheap, you know, they start selling them to advance their projects or build new mines. And then those mines come online faster than expected. And then maybe because of the green scare, governments start permitting new projects faster, you know, you hear what I'm saying? Like if this and this and this and this, like it's a lot of ifs here that would have to happen. Otherwise, I just think that the low hanging fruit gets picked. And then we have supply deficit for years before high prices, no matter how high they get, can cure them. It just You just can't build these things fast enough. Yeah. Do you actually believe that by 2030, fission, next gen and Denison will produce uranium? Any of them, some of them? Without commenting on the company or recommending any of them one way or the exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, Denison, yes. Vision and next gen. I'll be surprised. I mean, 2030, you. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we got more excited about this. In 2019, right? When 2018, 2019, when I first got into uranium, if you'd asked me, could that be built by 2030? I'd say, yeah, okay. But in 2024, would, yes. you know, <laughs> it's, it's, Not tough. I mean, yeah. it's, that's, the, these things take a long time. I mean, these are big projects. So I think that is at least highly questionable. Agreed, Lobo. Agreed. Uh, that was Lobo Tigre. Lobo, thanks for coming to my show. Uh, how can investors reach out to you? Well, thank you for asking. Quick version, independentspeculator.com. I have a free weekly speculators digest. The, the one promise I will make, can't promise you'll like it, but I can promise if you sign up, I will not spam you with a flood of daily advertising. I hate that stuff. You get one email per week, and then you see if you like my work. I can confirm that. Uh, thank you, Lobo, for coming to my show. It was a great chat. Yeah, thank you.